Hi, welcome to The Odd Times, interesting topics and random opinions. I'm Nick. I'm Clara. And I'm Tad. Welcome to Issue 2, Let's Talk About Writing. All Each of us has our own topic this week. We're going to start with Clara's, who's talking about types of stories. Um, and then we're going to move to my topic, which is character naming. And then we'll finish up with Nick's, which is world building. So, Clara, you want to talk us through your topic? Sure. So, I was curious about different kinds of story archetypes and how people have classified them over time. So, I found just a little short overview, so it's not like a lecture, <laughs> but <laughs> just get a feel for... Because there's been a lot of different opinions. Some people say there are three story types. I've seen as many as 36. <clears throat> Usually, people fall right around seven. But... Um, so I found in 1959, uh, Foster Harris asserted that there were only three basic plot patterns. Happy endings, unhappy endings, and tragedies. Which seems a So what's the difference between an unhappy ending and a tragedy? Good question. I think tragedies are sad all the way through. Ah. Okay. And unhappy endings aren't necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. But I didn't really find any, like, too much distinction. But I think, I think yeah, the idea is tragedies are sad the whole way. Um, then another author, Ronald Tobias, I hope I'm saying that right, uh, came out with 20 master plots. And these included things like underdog, yep, metamorphosis, ascension, oh. and dissension. There you go. So he had a lot more. Um, later, George Pulte, I hope I'm saying that right. Poultry. He said there were 36 types and had things like rivalry of kinsmen and falling prey to cruel misfortune. So I think he got a lot more specific <laughs> with his story type. Yeah. Um, then I guess in 1965, Kurt Vonnegut wrote a thesis um, where he said that stor classic stories all share a finite number of shapes. And he has like a whole graph, which I should have found a visual aid for. But he, he had graphs. So <laughs> interestingly, his thesis was actually rejected by the University of Chicago, which he was infuriated by. And went on to do a lot of lectures where he explained story shapes and how that was a thing and that they were stupid <laughs> and for rejecting his thesis. But he's you know, I have a I have a book here by some by Victoria Lynn Schmidt who took this fairly literally. Like she has a shape for each story. Like they're actually sketched in here. Uh, is it on a graph? Do you think? And um, it looks like the originals could have been. Mm, but. Okay. Um, but now they're just, they look like line graphs, but they're, they're kind of like the traditional story structure one, but they're all different. Right. Right. Um, so really briefly, Vonnegut argued that there were eight, really seven types of stories, and he called them man in a hole, character gets into trouble, then out, and is the better for it. Uh, boy gets girl, character, character stumbles upon something great, loses it, then gets it back forever. Uh, from bad to worse, character starts in a bad place and things just get worse. <laughs> uh, Game of Thrones. Right. Uh, and also, Count of Monte Cristo, isn't that a dissension plot? I think, yeah. Like, everything horrible happens to him. Yeah, yeah that doesn't go well. <laughs> um, which way is up? Uh, the story, like life, keeps us guessing about if events are good or bad. <laughs> Is that how he described it? That sounds like a shape Kurt Vonnegut would <clears throat> argue with the story. It does. Um, creation stories, so humanity receives gifts and in increments from, you know, big things like the sky, the earth, to smaller things like... I the, the the example I found was like sparrows and cell phones. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. Then well, they both sing and they both fit in your pocket. I guess there's some similarities. True. Sure. Um, then Old Testament humanity's given a gift by a deity, but then falls from grace and stays there. <laughs> um, and the New Testament, humanity's given incremental gifts, then falls from grace before receiving absolute bliss. And I don't know if there's only been one story in all of human history that fits that structure that you can really call it an archetype. 
You think? Wait, you, you said you think there has been I mean, more that's than one? Fairly, that's fairly specific to the New Testament. Like, I can't think of any yes. other stories that fit that shape. Like, that's one story. There's and more than I'm, one. The other one, there? the other mm-hmm. one that he that's the eighth, but is really just another example of the New Testament one that he loved to talk about in length is the Cinderella story. It's almost exactly the same. She's given gifts by her fairy godmother, shoes, a carriage, a dress, etc. Gets to go to the ball, you know, it, then it hits midnight and she falls from grace before getting... getting absolution. Yeah, absolute bliss yet again. And he was nope. fascinated between the similarities there and with, huh. and went over it a lot in his lectures. I mean, it seems strange that to That is me. interesting though to be fascinated by it because it it came after the new testament primarily right i mean it did so a clear derivation well depends on which version you listen to i mean the original german folk tale i'm sure happened before any of the folk in germany knew the new testament because they weren't even allowed to read the bible for hundreds of years well how how Um, close would it would it be to the original folk tale what we have now i mean oh that's a great yeah no and, idea. Well, which version was he talking about might be the more... The, the like, Disney version, I oh, think. Okay. Like, I don't know about Disney specifically, but that version of the story. Yeah. You know, fairy godmother comes, you know, midnight, she's got to leave, loses her shoe, prince finds her, that whole thing. Right. Um, did, did, it, did it involve foot cutting? He, uh, not that I know of. I didn't exactly watch then a bunch of his lectures. it was the Disney version. Like, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty I'm sure pretty it sure was the Disney, Disney version. the Disney version's the only one that they did not self-mutilate in. I think, so. yeah, that's, yeah. Well, <laughs> cheers to Disney for that, because self-mutilation <laughs> is not really... Yeah, does not a good car- kid's cartoon Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, neither does pushing values, but I don't yeah. know. That's well, and three, a whole different topic. Three, so almost half of his story archetypes are, are bible related which or you know are yeah. very religiously right. oriented which i feel like has i mean those are the vast majority of stories told by humankind throughout all of history have been religious like right. stories solely for entertainment kind of only came about after the printing press yeah i think before that a lot of stories had practical lessons to teach a lot of folk mm-hmm. tales and these stories that are now either folk tales were... or or mythology, yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. So his was interesting. I can see why the university was like, no. But <laughs> um, it did bring the categories into a more manageable number, which I think is appealing to a lot of people. Um, I mean, I think the oldest split was, was it Plato, I believe, who it was comedy or tragedy. Comedies were funny and had a happy ending. Tragedies were sad and had a sad ending. And it <laughs> Even Shakespeare followed that structure pretty much. Like you didn't, what we have, I guess, now called dramedies, where like things are angsty all the way through, but there's a happy ending. Like they didn't mm. even realize that could happen in ancient Greece. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think storytelling's definitely gotten more sophisticated over time. Well, I don't know if sophisticated is the right word. It more n- nuanced? Uh, well, people start like, to analyze it more, and there is true. more of it. Right. Yes. Like, which means there's more variation, because if we're producing 10 million stories a day now, I mean, I'm, that's a made-up number, then right. there is going to be a lot more variation than back when the same stories were told year after year after year, because most people only knew three or four. Right. Um, the next example of hmm. a group of story archetypes I've found, I personally like. I, I, I like them. I think they're a little more general and cohesive than Vonnegut's or, you know, the 36 other ones. And, um, so in 2004, Christopher lot. Booker, which is a very appropriate name for someone writing a book about storytelling. Yes, um, it is. He wrote a book that explained what he called the seven types of stories. So you okay. have Overcoming the Monster, Rags to Riches, The Quest, A Voyage and Return, Comedy, Tragedy, and Rebirth. So... Um, I have a quick synopsis so, of all of them if we need. Rebirth would be kind of like New Testament story, according to Vonnegut, wouldn't it? Yeah, he d- describes it as a, the hero falls under some sort of darkness, like a spell or an illness, sleep, and then they're eventually they're freed from that and find redemption. 
doesn't isn't that kind of like the boring flip side of a quest plot? Because if that's the plot, they're unconscious for most right. of it, and it's not a very good book. Yeah. Well, the, the I mean, you could argue Metamorphosis is like this, except that all that stuff happened before the story starts, and he wakes up as a cockroach. Right. <laughs> but, well, I mean, in that case, he's he's the actual protagonist. I don't know, like the. Well, I mean, it kind of just reminds me of the plot of Sleeping Beauty, except that wasn't really the hero, the sleeping person, you know. Right. Wasn't, wasn't I mean, I've read hero. a lot of fantasy stories that basically were this plot, but that was never the main character. Right. Yeah. Right. They were always the quest object, object not the yeah. quester. Yeah. Yeah, I... I think even one of the Conan movies was like that. <laughs> I, Is that I, where he throws the witch in the fire? <laughs> something like that. I think yeah. one, of, one of the examples I found of... A after re- a night of passion. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, after about three minutes of passion. Oh, you're right. Correctly. You're right. And he's like, okay, it throws her in the fire. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what? not even a thank you. <laughs> no, not even a thank you, ma'am. Just How rude. done. Throw her in the fire. <laughs> um... One of the examples I found, one of the examples I found of a reverse story would be um, Beauty and the Beast. He oh, I can see that. Put under but he's also spell. not the main character. But, I mean, yes and no. I mean, Bell functions in the story as almost like his redeemer, but it is a story about her falling in love with him and him not being a beast. He may not be the same character, but her participating in his rebirth is the story oh absolutely so, that's true so I just, yeah no i agree i think this is just um i think it's iffy that it's the hero but having yeah. an important character be under a curse or a spell or something and there, i you know yeah if you think of it as a spell not sleep or illness but like i'm cursed to not remember my own name so i must wander the land yeah looking yeah. for someone to break the curse that yeah. They are the main character, and there's no problem with that. So, yeah. right. well, another another example would be so the first type overcoming the monster that would be where the protagonist or the hero must face a great evil that threatens them, the world, their country, whatever, and they overcome that monster with a lot of difficulty but get a reward. Dracula is an overcoming the monster story. Dracula is arguably the main character and the monster. That's true. That so is true. I think it's more about it, I, he often says the hero or the protagonist, but I think. Just that being the main story, regardless of if the main, wherever the main character falls in to that. That's true. I think just that pattern. I think it's yeah. I think him him putting it as the hero or the protagonist is a little misleading, but overall the story structure is still there. I guess. Right. Right. Um. Yeah. I yeah. So. Yeah, that'd be overcoming the monster. Then there's, yeah, Rex Riches is a little obvious. Hero starts poor or insignificant, overlooked. Something happens that elevates them and makes makes people recognize their exceptional nature or, you know, their, their hidden talents or, you know, those kind of things. You're secretly a Mary Sue. <laughs> well, <laughs> one thing I would like, to, one thing is that a lot of young romances or especially gay romances follow this kind of structure as well they start out Mm. feeling like nothing feeling like the scullery boy in the fantasy stories where they're like i'm worthless i'm i don't fit in and there's no good reason for it and then they discover something about themselves that makes them often the hero Mm -hmm. like i can pull the sword out of the stone and slay the dragon um and things like that but a lot of romances are the same plot just done kind of internally where they kind of figure yeah. out who they are and why that's good. They start at the ugly duckling and end up self-actualized, I guess would be the way to put it. Well, in the yeah. the, the um, largely marginalized class, too. I mean, when you started referring to this particular subject or um, story arc, it reminded me of these novels that, that I'd heard about uh, in the early part of the 20th century that were basically like... And it, literal rags to riches novels you know they all started out poor and i can't remember and then you know became magnates of industry and all this and i can't remember the author's name but he produced about a billion of them i want to oh wow i want to say it was like anson or something like that Anson. i don't know let me see if i can find that but it's it's interesting that that it's evolved from like the financially um 
out of sorts to the like emotionally or culturally emotionally and socially yeah so mm-hmm. culturally yeah one thing i um, did notice with these types um that he lays out the seven there are comedy and tragedy there is not specifically romance like comedy has references things like you can have a romantic romances. comedy or a romantic right, tragedy. I think all of Shakespeare's comedies were romances. That was just kind of his thing. And a lot of the tragedies were too. Romeo and Juliet, you know, a very classic tragedy. So or, I did find it interesting that, and rightly so, romance isn't its own category. It just kind of can fit in any of them. But you're right. I think a lot of them are rags to riches kind of things. I mean, even look at like Aladdin. That's a rags to riches story, but it's also a romance story. His he doesn't ask the genie make me super rich. He says make me super rich so I can get with the princess. That's true. You know, circling back, uh, the the author who I couldn't remember was named Horatio Alger Jr. Um, oh, oh wow, eighteen hundreds or great yeah. middle of eighteen hundreds. And he he wrote young adult novels about impoverished boys and their rise from humble backgrounds to lives of middle class security and comfort through hard work. Determination. That sounds courage, really boring. And honesty. This is directly from the <laughs> wiki, does. by the way. Whoever wrote this did a pretty fantastic job. Um, his writings were characterized by the rags to riches narrative, which had a form- formative effect on the United States during the Gilded Age. So, I yeah, think, I mean, that's probably why I heard about it. Right. I think rags to riches story are, it, it's very much an American thing. We love those. You know, you have like oh, yeah, because Superman. It, it reinforces and, our national myth that anyone mm-hmm. can make it. Yeah. yeah. And it's, that your your net worth is a reflection of your worth. moral worthiness. Well, yeah. and how hard you work. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Which is increasingly not true. <laughs> yeah. Um, not correlated all that strongly. No. Um, I mean, computer jobs, I mean, oh my god. Yeah. Well, also, yeah, because then you run into a lot of social conflicts that have been around from the birth of civilization as to what counts as hard work. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, which the this archetype conversation according to Booker. Huh? Conversation you never want to get into. (laughs) 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 Um but yeah, according to Booker, he just says something happens to elevate them. It's not necessarily uh, (laughs) Right. Yeah. You know, very specific. Um so my my take oh sorry continue sorry oh, no go ahead it's okay it's like, my take on story types is they're probably about as accurate and useful as personality types for people which is very useful and semi-accurate but there is no definitive one it depends right. on what I traits agree. you're looking at i agree i think like i can think of as far as let's for example these seven categories most of the stories i can fit of would i think of would fit nicely into one of them if, right. You know, not that I consider myself a writer or anything, but when I am writing... You're a story, so a writer, Clara. Well, <laughs> You're a writer. Whatever. <laughs> 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 but when I'm writing a story, I don't necessarily think what kind, what archetype of story is this. I kind of like to let right. it develop, and often not till I'm done with the very the first or even the second pass do I look at it and go, oh, that's what the story's really about. Right. I think trying to do it on purpose will ruin your story. Your story has to breathe. It has to be alive. It has to tell you what kind of story it is. The first or second pass, you're still seeing the story. You can't try and fit it into a box yet, unless that helps your process. Everybody's process is different. I find a lot of people get stuck. They're like, but I can't make it fit the structure. Yeah. I think some of them, it makes, like, so... The two, there's the quest and the voyage and return that are almost exactly the same. The the main difference is the quest all happens in the character's world, and the voyage and return is a quest that takes place outside of their world and they come back to it. So Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland would be voyage and return because she is going on a quest, but it's in a different place. Like the Odyssey? uh, No, the Odyssey all takes place in his, the regular world. It's just a world in which gods and things like that are real. Yeah, but it's not really his house. Well, not his house, but it's he's still on the earth. He's well, not He's okay. not leaving the world or... I mean, he is sailing into the unknown, so it might be. Yeah, I think well, it is. I, I yeah. mean, honestly... That's true. Because not every story is going to have magical portals to alternate universes, but there are That's lots true. of Voyage and Return stories. Yeah, A classic one that 
almost every writing book in the world talks about that I have no interest in reading is Heart of Africa. Heart of Darkness. That's it. Heart, yeah. Oh. yeah. Heart of Darkness, which is also apparently Apocalypse Now, was a remake of that okay. same story. Ah, uh, that makes sense. Only, in, yeah, doesn't it? Like, that movie made so much more sense once I learned that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, but... So my point, <laughs> circling back to my long rambling point. Sorry about that. I, no, no, it's not your fault. I did it. But I'm saying, I think for stories like that, those would be things you would want to figure out at the onset. If your story is going to be, my character goes into a different world or into the unknown, you may want to n- know that at the beginning. <laughs> but I don't think it's a requirement. But maybe not. Yeah, but I, I don't think it it's a requirement. depends on what kind of writer you are. Yeah. And, and just because also, as a fantasy writer... Just because there's a portal into an alien alternate world does not mean that's actually the story structure that I'm using. That's Sometimes true. it's actually a romance or a defeating the monster story. Yeah. Or rags to riches. And it's just a little bit of world building. And I, yeah. And I think a lot of these could be used in tandem. Could you have a voyage and return story that's also a tragedy or also a comedy? 100%. Yeah. And so yeah, I think maybe. It, uh, oh, I was just going to say, I think for me personally, I think maybe these are more interesting or a cool like recognizing a pattern but as far as for actually writing a story i don't think that you have to have them and it might be more beneficial frankly not to overthink it depending on what kind of writer you are i think these are very useful structures and frameworks for analyzing stories but Mm -hmm. not necessarily useful for developing stories well it depends for most people i think i think it can be used pretty well if you think about it in terms of plot and subplot and like okay you know, this character but that's has if you're his a own plotter in advance. True, true. Is I mean, it... oh, sorry. It, there are a lot of different ways of doing it. Um, you can you can create arcs individually for your characters and see how that works out. You know, mm-hmm. um, you can do. Well, sorry. No, it's okay. I was pretty much petering out. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> this book. Um, that made me think of this book because it does not just have story shapes. She breaks it down into like three levels, which I found interesting. Um, the first was the structure. So she has 11 master structures, oh, wow. which are the roller coaster ride, the replay, which is like um, Groundhog Day. Oh, right. Fate, the parallel, the episodic, the melodrama, romance, the journey. So on these, she's actually talking about, like, literally how the scenes are put together in the story. Mm. Not what kind of story is it or what's happening in the story, but is this an episodic story, like a television show? Or is it a narrative story, like a movie? Is it uh, one of those ones that just repeats the same events over and over again? Things like that. Then it has the stories, and she has 55 dramatic situations. Wow. <laughs> in pairs, which I will not. Yeah. So, I will just read you a few, not the whole list. Supplication and benefaction, deliverance and sojourn, vengeance for a crime, and rehabilitation. So she has them as opposites. Mm. Um, and she even has really specific ones like enmity of kinsmen and hero to kinsmen, oh. which seem fairly specific. But her most basic is two, is it do they get their goal or do they fail? She says that's the first thing you look at is does your character succeed or fail? Right. Then you look at structure. Then you look at scenarios within the structure. Um, and I found it an interesting book, but like we were just talking about, I've never really – I use it to make some generators for coming up with stories, but right. I've not found it particularly helpful. Well, it kind of – like it, it goes really, really granular, but always comes back to – you know, what you were saying was Plato's original idea of tragedy and comedy, right? Because right. mm-hmm. it's either success or failure. Like, there is no uh, in-between. There is no fear well, of Well, except that there, there is, because there's there's succeeding yeah. at your goal and having it be what you wanted. There is failing well, at your goal and having everything be awful. That's what we think of as comedy and tragedy. Right. But there is succeeding at the goal you were aiming for only to realize that what you needed was something else, which is an unhappy ending, even though you succeeded. Mm-hmm. Right. And then there's uh, more commonly, because we do love happy endings, and I can't blame us for that, uh, we lose at the goal, the character, the main character loses at the goal they have been trying for the entire story, and then they discover that's not really what they needed at all, and they find what they really wanted. So, so there's maybe, kind of four. Like, yeah. describes every screwball comedy ever. <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. also common in romances. Yeah. That right. what they think they want for the whole thing is turns out to not be at all what they need at the right. end. Yeah, it was really their best friend that they should have ended up with. <laughs> like, oh, oh my. 
Um, or perhaps that guy you thought you had the hots for is just weirdly bonded to your unborn baby. Oh God, apparently. <laughs> I, I can see from Nick's face that he never had the joy of reading that series of books. That's a good thing. I didn't read it, but I've heard enough about it. Know what you're referencing. I can't tell if you're like, I don't want to. I don't know if we're supposed to. I mean, you might as well say anything. it, but I mean, just. Spoiler <laughs> it's just alert a Twilight for... series. It's, oh, yeah, it's Twilight. Oh, gotcha. Oh. Yeah, so like. Like 10, 15 years ago, I think we're past spoiler alerts, thankfully. Uh, probably. Yeah, by probably. now. Because I haven't read them or watched the movies, but I knew what <laughs> you're talking about. Speaking of Twilight, um, oh my god. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> Robert Pattinson is the new Batman. What? <laughs> right. That would yeah. be odd. It, it's, it, apparently they're making a new Batman movie, and he's going to be Batman. Young Bruce is he Wayne. going to be having an American sort accent, or are they changing Batman's backstory? He better have an American accent, because that would be really lame. He just grew and, up with Alfred, and weird. it sort of osmosed into him, the British. Oh, God, hopefully not. <laughs> well, maybe, um, maybe, maybe in this version of Batman, he was um, raised by his butler, who yeah. was British, right? Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, he was in, in the original after his parents were killed, so... <sighs> yeah. yeah. I Alfred would imagine him. he'll do English. An, like an, or not English, but an American oh. accent. Because that would be too... I don't think people would... I mean, people are already going to be upset that he's Batman. I think making it him and a British him, they'll be like, why is, like, Cedric Diggory, like, a Batman right? now? He died. Get over it. Batman is so... Though it kind of cracks me up when you talk about actor nationalities. So, hmm. the very first... So, the, the myth of Zorro, um, he was a Spaniard in mm -hmm. Mexico. Like, he was the Dawn. They were before they were independent of Spain. But, like, every actor who ever played Zorro was Mexican. They finally got a Spanish actor to play Zorro, Antonio Banderas, and in that version, he was playing a Mexican Zorro. Like, deliberately not Spanish. <laughs> They're just like, we will not get this right, ever. <laughs> right? Ever. <laughs> um, Circling back to Batman yeah. real quick. Oh, back to Batman? Yeah, I, I had a question. It's weird that it's, like, an inverse of rags to riches. Right? Batman? Yeah, he's already rich and he goes and, he and immerses himself riches. in like slums to fight crime. Oh, here's an interesting exercise. It's... What of these seven story archetypes would Batman fall into? Well, that's kind of where I was going with yeah. it. Yeah. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I... He's all superhero stories, as far as I can tell, are clearly number one overcoming, overcoming the, monster. the monster. Yeah. You cannot yeah. have a superhero story without a supervillain. Well, or at least I've never seen one. I mean, right. some personally. even deal with that, overcoming the monster personally, because they have such, you know, crazy power, and we all know <coughs> power I'm corrupts. always angry. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Superman from some of the reboot movies. Uh, it, he was he was outrageous right there. Superman is mm -hmm. often classified as a rags to riches story, because he is raised as Starts poor. out an ordinary boy. Yeah, an right. orphan and then well, discovers that he's exceptional. Well, you know? Except that that's, that's more kind of like middle, middle class, class America, America, suburbia. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly... Like, he was an orphan, he's, but come on. Yeah, he, he had a great family. If you get adopted as a baby by a middle class yeah. family, I don't think you get to play the orphan card. No. Just, you don't. No. I mean, I think it depends on who you ask. If, like, so if, you're really, I mean, true. if you're really, really rich and someone's like, he was adopted by farmers, people might be like, oh, that poor boy. <laughs> <laughs> Superman? Well, that's true. Well, that's Superman true. was a know. farmer? No. I think most... That's true, because he was a prince back on his own planet. Yeah, well, and so it would definitely it was definitely like a downgrade so, from prince so slash riches superhero to rags to, to riches, riches well, to middle class to riches. And Wait. Rag so rags to riches isn't necessarily poor to rich. It's also insignificant or overlooked or being unrecognized at, for your talent. Impoverished or in some way. Yeah, and so if he right. thought he was a regular human as a child, and this that and other than he was lifting cars at two. Like, no one ever believed he was an ordinary boy. Not well, even him. It could have been briefly. <laughs> it doesn't say how long. It could have been, but considering I remember the visual from one of the old comics, and he's, like, holding a car above his head in a diaper, and his mom's at the door going, <gasps> <laughs> So I'm pretty sure that, like, the cat was out of the bag at that point. Well, and he didn't... <clears throat> I, don't, I don't know Superman very well, but did he even have that level of power when he was on Krypton? 
Like and he was too little of a baby. Well, yeah, and the yellow it. sun thing, right? So he wouldn't. Have, right. And, well, they had a red sun. Yeah, like the whole point, the whole reason that he's a superhero on Earth is because allegedly his home planet was like harsher and like heavier gravity, and like so he's not actually a superhero. Anyone from that planet would have well, these powers on Earth. Was the well, feeling that I got. I, I thought it was specifically related to the the like the type of sun that we had. Or something that, here on Earth. Uh, that sounds vaguely familiar. Yeah. I remember the thing reference, but I don't know enough about so, it. So, but to... there's like multiple like rags and riches sliders going on, depending on what I, you're looking at. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's an example of something that would fall under multiple categories because right. then you also have a, multiple overcoming the monster storylines throughout his. Mm-hmm. I think it would. Well, in comics on... in general, there is no one story. Like they right. work on all yeah. the time and have yeah. Oh, so, so you can't sad. really pick a comic book character and be like, "What story?" Because they've literally done every permutation they can think of. Which already. universe? Yeah. Like. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it depends on like his origin story. I would say is potentially rags to riches, and then after that, it's a lot of overcoming the monster but right yeah i would agree i would agree so an interesting thing that i found when i was looking for story types was i guess um a few years ago i apparently did not write down what year but i want to say 2016 i will double check um researchers from the university of vermont fed like 1737 stories from project gutenberg all in english all fictional into a a program to um, analyze the stories, their language, their emotional content, and categorize them. So they kind of use like data mining <laughs> to come up with uh, story types. And they came up with six different ones, this computer program did. And they were calling them core trajectories that stories can follow versus archetypes or storylines. So they said that what their computer program found was Rags to riches, so a rise in happiness. Tragedy, a fall in happiness. Uh, Man in a hole, fall, then rise. Icarus, rise, fall. Cinderella, rise, fall, rise. And then Oedipus, fall, rise, fall. And they said the most commonly downloaded story types seem to be Cinderella, Oedipus, Man in a Hole, and then Cinderella with a tragic ending. (laughs) So, apparently... So, would that be Rise, Fall, or Rise, Fall, Rise, Fall? So, Cinderella with a tragic ending would be Rise, Fall, fall, Rise, Fall. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, apparently, people like happy endings, but they really like not happy endings. (laughs) Well, okay, (laughs) but but we're looking at Project Gutenberg. So these are all non copyrighted stories. They're all yeah. older stories, and absolutely tragic endings were bigger back then. Yeah. But also, right now, you're not looking at reader preferences. You're looking at the preferences of readers who like really old stories. Yeah, and then download said stories. Right. Yeah. From Gutenberg, Project Gutenberg specifically. <clears throat> um, like they're a fairly specific market of readers, I think. Yeah. So that data might be out of out of date it would be interesting to do the same sort of analysis with fanfic because there's so much Mm -hmm. more of it to analyze and it's more modern right right which circling back uh, unfortunately (laughs) to twilight um a while back a friend of mine had gone to see one of the 50 shades of gray movies uh with his girlfriend and i i had told him i'm like did you do you know that that series is actually fanfic that fan, the whole Fifty Shades of Grey is actually fan fiction of Twilight uh-huh. and then pornography. <laughs> so <laughs> And fanfic of BDSM? Bad, bad pornography. I've not read yeah. them, but I've seen some excerpts. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan of either thing. I have not read them in, you know, I, I'm not going to pretend that I have, but it just is interesting that a series which ended up being successful also spawned a separate series that's also successful. That was fanfic ori- originally. Like, I think mm-hmm. that's a fascinating example of somebody taking a story and characters and kind of just reworking it and making it their own and it being a separate thing that people still like. Right, even people who didn't like the original. Right. Like, they are slightly different core fan groups, I think. Twilight and Fifty Shades. But there's so. probably a ton of overlap and Oh yeah, there there is a ton of overlap, yeah. There's a I don't know, the fact that an author would do that to their own work, and that's kinda how I see it, because it's it's a it's 
deriving another thing, like distilling it even further into this other thing. Um, I don't like. Well, not not all fan fiction distills though. Like this, for example, was a um, alternate universe fiction. So she took the core personalities of the main characters and put them in a totally different scenario. Oh wow! With a totally different relationship, because of the original fanfic. Bella, is that her name? Bella. I think um, so. Bella was a it, college but... student at a Seattle university, and Edward was her professor, who was human. Whereas in the original, she is a high school student in Forks, and <laughs> Edward is a vampire. Right. Identical themes, really. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they they definitely explores a lot of the same themes as the original, as a lot of fanfic does, but not all. Well. Uh, but it put it in a totally different scenario. Yeah. Enough that all she had to do was a global search and replace on their names to give them new names, and a lot of people couldn't even tell that it was a fanfic. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. That's... But I heard at one point the published version still had some typos that had been on the online published version <laughs> of the original fanfic. Wow. Don't know if that's true. I heard a rumor. Right. <laughs> um, Another cash cow coming in. Right, yeah, apparently. <laughs> By the way, I will uh, plug a book right here. There was a great book called Fic, F-I-C, by, I'm trying to remember her name. She played Tara on Buffy. Oh. I don't know. Mm, I know her name. I'll have to look it up and put it in the Yeah, notes. well, we can put it in the description, uh, and I'll, refer- I'll um, put a link to is it? the book and the article that I found also about the... Okay, good. Yeah, oh, Fic sorry. explores fan fiction as a phenomenon, um, including fan fiction as far back as Sherlock Holmes, who had quite a bit of fan fiction published at the time, mm. um, and the conflicts within fandom as to whether fic should be ever sold for profit, even if you change the names, mm. um, and things. It's a fascinating book, a very good academic study. Uh, Amber Benson. Her name is Amber Benson. Um, it was a very interesting study of the phenomenon of fanfic and how it's been going on a lot longer than the internet. I mean, I find it fascinating, and you know, as someone yeah. who's written a fair amount of fanfic, uh, mostly about mm-hmm. post-apocalyptic uh, worlds. <laughs> um, right. I um, mean, that was where I got my start. You know, you it's it's nice because you start with a fully developed world and you don't have to. It's it's like a shortcut to getting yeah some access actually. And, um, I found now I came I came to fanfic late because I started writing well before there was an internet. I mean there were there were Star Trek zines, but I didn't have access to them, right. so I didn't even know fanfic was a thing until much later. And what I found writing fanfic is that it's not really a shortcut for the writer. In fact, what it felt like to me was more like writing historical fiction. You had to do mm. a crap ton of research well. if you really wanted it to be accurate in the world, which I did. Uh, but it was kind of a short, as a reader, you didn't have to get through the awkward getting to know them phase. Like you yeah. already knew these characters and the world and you could just enjoy the story. Well, oh yeah, I guess it depends on how you do it. Like with my fanfic, I tended to, to steal the world and the setting, mm-hmm. and then write my own characters within that, and um, mm. you know, kind of create my own story within the, you know, the world. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, See, I was mostly writing in Harry Potter, which is an intricately detailed world that a lot right. of people know a lot of right. details on. And the yeah. relationships so I used are very like, specific. I had thirty tabs open on my browser. Yeah. I've got like the stack of Harry Potter books, one of which was completely covered in. Like post it because I went through one time and marked every time that Snape was on screen yeah. versus every time he was just talked about. Like I had all this reference. It was crazy. I did not finish many fics personally. When I was a teenager, before I knew fan fiction was even a thing, I would just kind of in my head tell myself different stories with characters that I really liked. Like I so <laughs> yeah. No, my embarrassing secret is that in early high school, without knowing what it was, my friends and I all wrote band fic for each other, which is one of the most embarrassing things you can do. Band fic? Yeah, fandom is like all the NSYNC fan fiction out there. Now, we were not NSYNC fans, thankfully. Gotcha. Oh, but, and it was, and it, was po- it was post New Kids on the Block for me, thankfully. <laughs> Just to show you how old I am. Um, but yeah, we used to write smutty band fic for each other before oh, wow. we knew that was a thing. And then I read, discovered the internet, I'm like, oh god, I was one of those people and I didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, that, that totally happened for me too. Like, later, I was like, either talking to you or looking at something on the internet and I'm like, 
other people do this too and I was like so much less <laughs> embarrassed because yeah I'd be like oh I love this character in this world and I would just think about them in different situations or like what if this other character was there who was me but not me and then I was like oh but totally not me yeah except so that you, you would like build a Mary Sue who had red hair and green eyes and I'd be like well yeah not a Mary Sue but <laughs> <laughs> no but you couldn't if you were, if it was a self insert because right. you have red hair you no one would be able to tell if it was a Mary Sue or not that's true. Uh-huh. Be, because yeah. that is the giveaway, is the red hair. Or, know, or really... raven hair. Uh, or white right. hair. Any mm-hmm. any strange hair. Like, pretty yeah, that's much. true. I, I like all the anime comics and Pink stuff where it's hair. like, yeah, you'll it'll be this regular scene of all these like school kids and one will have pink hair and they're like, guess which is the main character? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, right. it's really, it's not even necessarily about hair, it's about creating difference. Like, you know, um, there's tons of animes like let's take uh, black clover that's a recent one the main character has the biggest sword in the land you know it's, it's i like don't get the big sword thing common. that's oh. been that's been an aesthetic thing for a few decades now that i just don't get every time i look at it I'm like that just doesn't I like mean, claymores are big claymores are hard to use and claymores look like tiny pointy daggers compared to a lot of these <laughs> swords yeah, I, yeah, I think it has to do with uh, the target audience yeah. Let's yeah. say. That makes sense. Big sword. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My thought was, yes, 13-year-old boys being the target audience, but... Right. Largely. Right. Yeah. Big swords are or 13 year Or old 13-year-old girls, but they're not watching the big swords. They're watching the guys. Right. Huh. I mean... Some of them. I don't know. Well, yeah, <laughs> some of them. We're talking in broad stereotypes it's, here. Yeah. It's tr- yeah, yeah, it's true. <laughs> so... Back to story archetypes briefly. I think yes. where, for me personally, they could be the most useful would might be editing. I agree. If you've already written your story and then you're going back and you're like, part of this doesn't feel it's right, part saggy. of this story feels awkward, I feel like I need more something, then you could look and be like, okay, well, maybe this is a overcoming the monster story so what do i need i need the threat to feel more imminent i need the scale to feel more realistic or big like i think in that way for me personally these kind of archetypes could really help absolutely i agree and there's actually a topic i want to cover on a later issue that is a pacing chart that rebecca came up with based on some of this but it's for every story and i've literally not found a story that doesn't fit this but it's it's not a formula it doesn't tell you what happens it only tells you kind of where the tension needs to be mm. and where the tension needs to resolve and things like that like that's cool the most speci- it is it's really cool but it's a long topic so i'm gonna want to do right. it as its own thing but yeah. and i found that that's that's a little more useful for when you're writing because you can kind of look ahead and be like well i know i'm gonna need to amp up the tension over the next few chapters so what needs to happen to, right to bring monsters closer or something right, so, right. yeah yeah, definitely. But it's Very but cool. it's also useful when you're editing because you can look at the whole thing and be like, okay, there's this giant hole in the middle of my story where all they're doing is random stuff that is equally tense, right? <laughs> Which is not a good story, BT dubs. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so I that... just laughed water all over my face. <laughs> I know. What a tra- what a tragedy. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. That could be that could be a fall archetype rather than a tragedy archetype. It's okay. They're clean now. I'm back, up. I'm back to neutral. So it's baby. a rebirth. So it's rebirth. Exactly. Yeah, you're back. You were under a watery curse, and now you're back. Woo! I overcame the monster or something. Yay! Success. I was on a quest. The entire time to clean my glasses. Okay, well, now you're just inserting <laughs> their <laughs> titles in. So that's all. That's about all I have for. Uh, I didn't know I needed it. Story archetypes. So that's about it for my topic. Uh, we're going to take a short break and then we'll be right back with Tads. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring that bell if you want notifications. And we'll be right back. All right, welcome back to The Odd Times, issue two, in which we talk about writing. Um, This section, we're going to focus on character naming. And um, 
it's kind of an open topic. I don't think you have to know anything to have opinions. So <laughs> what do you guys feel about character naming? What names do you like or dislike? And are they different for you as a reader than they are as an author? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Expound. <laughs> Uh, well, I'll start with the last part first. They're very different in terms of what I like to read and what I like to write. Um, mostly because when I write, I rarely finish anything, so I'm still talking about characters with names that are significant for me to, uh, to construct the narrative, right? So I'll make, like, Hero McHeroes and... You know, a you person have a, have a like name. I would never want to read that, but <laughs> ever. <laughs> that would be really weird. It's a word. I mean, it's a I working mean, it would, name. You can change. Well, later. yeah, but Makes I mean, it, out, outside of a comedic storyline, I don't see that doing <laughs> right. very well for me. <laughs> no. Um, no, though I did yeah. once read a comic fantasy novel called Sir Apropos of Nothing. There you go. So That's it can be done. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> Um, I personally, yeah, I like char some character names that I like. I would never have that kind of thing in a thing I was writing, but that's because I personally do not care for overly long, complex character names. Mm. And so some names that I like in a story that aren't necessarily super long and complex, but like say some of the, some of the names from like Lord of the, Lord of the Rings, like Galadriel, I think mm -hmm. I like the name. I think it fits the character beautifully. Would I write a name like that? Probably not. <gasps> I, I, no, just because I like more simple... Most of the things I like to write are set in the real world. And so having more sure. um, realistic Down names makes more sense. And that is a big dividing character name. How you handle names yeah. set, and stories set in the real world is going to be radically different than how you handle names in a totally made up world. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, so, I mean, as a reader, I don't know. I mean, I, there's a little story. I grew up reading the Drag Dragonlance. The, Dragon the Dragonlance Chronicles. That's ah! what it was. <laughs> ah, so there is a character in there that I believe she only ever really went by Laura or Laurel. But her real name was like this really complex. All the elves in this world had like 12 syllable names mm -hmm. that they used with each other. And then a shortened form that humans could actually pronounce. And her name, I think, was Laurel Lanthalus. But oh, I seriously yeah. never actually read the whole name. It was just like yeah. this whole long. I made it up in my head as I read it. I was like laurel something else and then eventually like when i was 17 i went back and actually looked at the name to see and it was nothing like the name that i had in my head <laughs> yeah see if they're too long and complicated i do that too i'll gloss i'll like gloss over them and i'll be like okay i know what that name yeah. looks like but yeah. i will not read out a 12 syllable Who cares? name <laughs> yeah <laughs> I'll be like, oh that guy okay yeah cool. your brain just fills in the blanks anyway <laughs> like <sighs> Sure, I know what that is, yeah. That's that guy. Okay, okay so <laughs> other than length, what are some issues with names that are problematic, like pronounceability or odd punctuation? Or Definitely. what things do you like, what things do you hate in that list? I mean, both of those things uh, would seem to have their place, but... I don't know if I know what that place is. <laughs> well, okay, here's I a good example it. of actually using um, punctuation well, and that is Dragon Riders of Pern by Anne McCaffrey. Because when you become a dragon rider, your name gets shortened and you get an apostrophe. Mm -hmm. But That's they have, it's part of the world. Yeah. And it's explained. Right. So you actually get to see some of the names before and after that process. And I always thought that was a nice little detail yeah, but when yeah. you've got a bunch of names that are like Ushvashid or something and they've just got random apostrophes put in there I'm like is that a glottal stop is that a click what is that yeah. <laughs> too many consonants uh. yeah. I, I like how some authors uh, I'm going to reference Tolkien again because he he had longer names so like Pippin was called Pippin but he was Peregrine Took so he right. had his given name but then you didn't have to read Peregrine Took a million Every time. times, right. and like Only Mary, like Gandalf was really mad. Yeah, yeah, which which <laughs> gave you good context yeah. Yeah. for the, the, his emotions, and the same with Mary, Meridoc Brandebach. Like it was long, but well, just Mary. And, the, and that is an advantage of nicknames. It does mm -hmm. give you a little more to play with as an author when it comes to intonation in a scene. Like, right. yeah. like do you do you call your character Mac, or do you call him like? James Henry Thoreau David McAvoy, I am so mad at you right now. 
Right. Yeah. <laughs> you, you said Mac. You said Mac, and my uh, <laughs> my brain went to Ronald McDonald. Uh, right, because right, I watched. Right. Way... Mine went to a character on uh, Agents of Shield. Yeah, mine, Mac. Uh, mine was. Uh, uh, always it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Mac's actual name. Yeah, uh, that you which learn. which you don't learn till later, and yeah. it's very funny, and it's a whole thing. Yeah, and oh, that's, that's funny. So that's a good example, I think, of how <laughs> having a more manageable name can lead to more interesting storylines later. Well, yeah. and it, it represents something about the context, right? Too. So, mm-hmm. like, it, it, in Mac's case, you know, his parents were. It, he's an embarrassing name. <laughs> I mean, maybe they really liked Ronald, and they were like, "Fuck it." You know, like, maybe. <laughs> maybe we really it like happens. we want we want Ron McDonald, like, to be yeah. our son. <laughs> and they well, that's like it, Indiana Jones. What was his real name? We oh. didn't learn it till the mo- third movie or something. Oh, is that not his real name? No, no Indiana was the dog. In the the was movie that dog? had um, Sean Connery, yeah, had right? Yeah, Sean Connery in it. It was that was his Indiana Jones's father, and it was a running joke through the whole movie. He's like, oh. "I'm Indiana Jones." It's like Indiana was the dog, and he oh, was actually wow. such and such junior. Like was his actual name, which we did not learn until wow. we'd already known the character a while. And I thought that I said something remember. about the character right? that it wasn't his name, that it was his dog's name, and that literally no one in the world but his dad knew. That he had taken his mm. dog's name rather than the name he'd been born with. <laughs> That's interesting. I think it's it's interesting how yeah you can use a character's name to add a lot to the story. Yeah. If you want. It. Well, in the I case- think one thing is we were talking earlier about pronunciability and consonants and apostrophes. Mm-hmm. I realize that a lot of what's missing in bad names like that is that other people in the story are not reacting to that name the way anyone we know would react to that name. Yeah. So either you need to explain to us why this is a culture where nobody minds taking two minutes to say a long, unpronounceable name. Right. Or they need to have reactions that are a little more understandable to the modern reader. Yes. Right. Um, so a, a naming problem I encountered recently with the story was I had two characters, a father and a son, who had very similar names. I remember that. Yes, and it was uh, like Floyd and Lloyd, which is very realistic and totally made sense with the setting and the time period. You would have that, a father and son with very similar names. But then, yeah, I think you had like read uh, a rough draft of it, and you were like, that's too confusing. I I could not not keep track of who. Yeah. Yeah. Another herd that I've heard as a rule is never have two main characters whose names start with the same initial. Because mm. for a lot of readers, they won't even bother to like yeah. really read the right. name. They'll scan just... it. Yeah. So if you have like Henry and Hannah, they <laughs> might get those names confused, actually. Which makes sense. Yeah. And, and yeah, and I hadn't thought of it, and you pointed it out, and I'm like, okay, that makes sense. Me as the author, I know which is which, and don't get them mixed up. But yeah, as a reader, you might not. And you. And I was I was sad about that because you're right. That is such an accurate detail, especially from that time period. Yeah. But um, I found another name that I switched the father to that was also very period appropriate, but totally different. So, And I think it worked out just fine. But that was something yeah. I had never thought of up until that point. And then once you said it, I'm like, that that makes so much sense. Mm-hmm. And that's but yeah, we don't, we don't see the names we write through the same lens Mm-mm. as the names we read. Yeah. I mean, I found that I personally do follow the rule of no character can start with the same initial because, frankly, when I'm brainstorming, I want to be able to just write down a single letter and move on instead of having to write their name out the whole time. That makes so, sense. so if I've got two characters with the same first initial, it suddenly my notes become a lot more confusing. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And okay. I every character starts out with the initials MC for main character in my brainstorming. Oh yeah, I cannot do that. I have to have. A name, even if I change it later. Yeah. One time I couldn't think of a character's name, so I just called, referred to him as Zebra because I knew I could switch it out really easy. That and word you're not going to run into that word anywhere yeah, else. Yeah, it would not appear anywhere else. Find and replace. Yeah, find and replace is easy. I knew there was no other there's no Zebra's reference, yeah. so I could switch it out. And by the time I start writing, absolutely, it's in the initial brainstorming. Oh, that it's okay. MC or right. like I'll have FMC and MMC or just like random mm. appellates that I'm just like that one character who does this annoying thing only shorter like, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so when it comes to made up names like fantasy names do you guys prefer the alphabet soup method where they just are comp- 
completely connotation. It's just made up words like Daenerys Targaryen, or actually, I don't even know if I said that right. Or do you prefer like real life names or stuff based on real life meanings but changed, like Albus Dumbledore? What kind of names do you like? Um. Well, it's, I I'm not sure I have a preference there. It kind of depends on the 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 context. Um, like, especially if it's a story based in the real world, you know, you would use names that are representative of the culture that you're writing within or about. Um, you know, you'd probably, I mean, an American might be Mark Smith or like John but Smith. But yes, if you're going to be writing in modern America and their name is Daenerys Targaryen, you better have <laughs> a good backstory. story. Yeah. Well, it was after Game of Thrones, of course. <laughs> Well, yeah, now, well, yeah, I would assume it would be in a world in which that did not exist as a fictional I place. Mean, maybe. Or it's in <laughs> our world 20 years from now, where they're like, yeah, I know there are five girls in my class named Daenerys, but... Yeah, it's Khaleesi, apparently. Khaleesi. Uh, That's the I big one. I personally don't mind a made-up name. I don't like the word soup. There's 12 vowels next to each other. Oh, no, that's not what I meant. I just meant, like, you actually, like, Tam is an alphabet soup name for one of my books. Mm, like it, right. it does have a meaning in Irish. It's a kind of hat, I think. Huh. But in the world that this story is set yeah. in, it's just a syllable that means him. Yeah, right. that's what I meant by alphabet soup, oh, as yeah. opposed okay. to based on real things. I have a similarly named main character in one of my stories. So, oh, yeah, Gan. Gan. Ah, Gan. I I like I I especially when they're short. I think that kind of name works great. Because it sounds familiar enough that your brain's not, what is this? But it's a little bit different. So it's not Dan or Bob. Right, right. You know, and right. I like that. And yeah, you can't really have a high fantasy set in an alternate world with main character Bob. I mean, I've seen yeah, it done. It can happen, mm -hmm, but usually mm -hmm. it's comedic. Right? Well, and for example... My, my ex used to title every single RP character Bob, like on video games and stuff. Like, oh. we'd be playing Darkstone and, like, these epic fantasy quests. I'm like, I'm Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it kind of takes some of the luster and <laughs> fantasy out of it. it yeah, it does. It affects the, the the reader's suspension of disbelief, right? I yeah. mean, like, mm -hmm. certainly. So, I mean, unless you were intending to, as an author, kind of reach out and, like, you know, mess with them a little bit, you know? Yeah, unless it, you're trying to do, like, an, an on-the-nose comedy. Like, very Monty Python. Or breaking the fourth wall. You know, yeah, that exactly. That's what I was going to say. It's yeah. like cracking the fourth wall. Yeah. To have a high fantasy character named Bob or John. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, it's really weird when I'm reading a book that is largely the traditional kind of alphabet soup way of just names that sound like that character. And you'll run across, like, a real name, and it kind of jerks me out of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, depending on the name. Like, right. if it's odd enough name, like, when I was a kid, Derek, nobody was actually named that. So if you came mm. across that in a fantasy world, like it kind of fit with yeah. the other kinds of yeah. names. <laughs> um, but if otherwise, now my problem when I'm naming stuff for writing is when I'm doing the alphabet soup version, it's really hard to find words that don't remind me of real words. That then right. that brings in this whole yeah. like connotation, like can I call him that or is everyone going to be thinking of this other thing that is not good? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I go. I was going to say, I think sometimes you can get a mix of real world names and fantasy names. So if you were to say the, let's say the um, Daenerys Targaryen, people There's call also John Snow. Well, people call her mm. Danny. Oh, that's true. They yeah. do. And there are characters in the book with those names, you know, Rhaegar, like these more fantasy style names, but there's also Robert. There's Ned. Right. There, you know, and none and, of those trigger. And like, yeah, they don't feel. No, they all fit together. But, in but that it's world. also it's well aside from Robert, he's not being called Bob. No, um, he's not. First of all, <laughs> um, but like Ed or Ned Stark is actually Eddard Stark, right? Right. And, and Danny is. And Ned, Ned is a real world name. Ned it was is. a super common name for a long time. And, and yeah. so is Nettered, but, like, it's so old world that it's not commonly referred to mm -hmm. ever. And I was yeah. actually thinking about that, too, in the context of Tolkien, because your uh, earlier point, um, you know, how it breaks you out of mm -hmm. it when it's too similar to the real world. Um, and I was thinking about Sam. 
because no, yeah, that is a that, is that a, should have that it should, should have, have right pulled mm-hmm. me out. Yeah, but they established Samwise, Samwise. early enough, I guess. Yep, yeah. yep. And that so it's real like, names that are nicknames don't seem to do it. They the don't have that way. effect. It's weird. Yeah. I, I, I yeah. just gotta chill. Yeah, no, so profound. <laughs> like, no. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's that's an interesting uh, yeah. thing. I think I think a lot of it is the world you create, and if the names makes sense got a clue <laughs> like having having say game of thrones that is fantasy but it has a very medieval feel and so having some fantasy names and some more real world names both does not feel out of place yeah right and so i think that's where a lot of the context comes in and and that's that's actually another question that i had is in most books do you think names should be intricately tied to the world you've created or should they just be like that dude's name is Mary. We don't really care why. Right. I think there is a line. I like names that reference something, as long as it's not too on the nose. So I think you had mentioned Albus Dumbledore at one point. Yes. Um, in Harry Potter, there are a lot of names that are so, like... Remus Lupin is literally like Wolf right? Wolfington. Like it's it yeah. is so, if you know, get those references, it is Except so no. on the nose. No, because it's Lupin. It's a flower. It's not Lupine. It's but oh, it's spelled on. like the flower. But oh, yeah, no, mm. it's obviously mm. no. And she did, and it was a kid's book, so I get that. Yes, yeah. yes. And I'm sure to the target audience at the time, it didn't. Any, I wouldn't have known Albus meant white or Lupin meant wolf when right. I was yeah. eight or ten. No. Some of but as an adult well. with a little bit of Latin knowledge, some of her names and spell names were pretty hilarious. Yeah. Definitely. Well, yeah, even Sirius Black. I think Sirius is the dog constellation. Yes. Like so, are, so yeah. those were some. I think also. some of her names were great in that. Yeah, you wouldn't necessarily unless unless you knew a lot about constellations, you wouldn't think. Serious Black, I bet he's a dog. Like, right, you, but like they're did, subtle she did enough. use it to foreshadow. Yes. And... Yes. And so I think if you do that in the right way, then yeah. If, if it's too on the nose, it gets a little like, okay, come on. Did she... Right. <laughs> the question in my mind, though, is did she do that with intent from the outset yes. to earmark them yes. for herself as she wrote? Or from what I understand, okay. I don't know if it was to earmark them for her, but right. she she very much pays attention to meaning when she names yes. characters. That's no why doubt. A but... while back when I saw that, oh, the first question Snape asked Harry Potter, you know, if you translate those, it means I regret Lily's death. I, at first I was like, that's silly. And then I'm like, no, wait, that feels like something she would do because she Absolutely. likes those subtle Mm-hmm. Meaning. She senses. loves symbolism. Yes. It's, symbolism through words it's is something in- she. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a really interesting insight into her writing process, too, because, you know, mm-hmm. it's. You get the sense it's a lot more freeform. Like. Uh-oh. So that. That kind of leads me to another question, which is, as writers, when you're not coming up with your working names, but your names other people will read, how do you approach a connotation? How do you get names that feel like that character? And are there names you can't use because they've got negative connotations for you personally? Mm. That's a good question. I'd say no to the last part of that, Uh, with the exception of, like, obviously, and it's not to me personally, it's just... You know, any celebrity name or name of something that is already huge um, and or too similar to that, you know, um, yeah. unless, you know, I would Unless doing it's it. deliberate. Yeah, unless it's deliberate. Like, there's a, <laughs> it's a really great anime, JoJo's Bizarre Adventures, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where, yeah. wherein the author, uh, for, for like the first two to three seasons and or series in the manga they're all like a lot of the characters are named after bands and it Mm. it works it's very it's like intriguing almost in a as you read it you know you're just like who am i gonna see you know coming up in these bands and then they all sort of have even a little bit of uh, personality derived from like the nature of the band like huh. so, it's yeah. it's just really kind of an interesting dimension to be able to mm-hmm. view that story from. Yeah, uh, it's, is. it's funny and it's very obvious. It's not like they try to yeah. hide it. Yeah, it's like not... it's like this character well, is called yeah. ACDC. They, they can't like... do that in America. <laughs> yeah, they have to change <laughs> right. it for the American yeah. version. Well, like I had a, a character in one story I started who loved science fiction, so her cat's name was Asimov. Yeah, that makes sense. Our yeah. is named Isaac. Yeah, our cat's named Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, so, but definitely. you know, like I could, I can't write a story with major characters who have like my parents' first names. Yeah, mm -hmm. because that's, those names are too strongly attached to specific people. That's what for I. Me. That's one of the things I was going to say was that I couldn't weird. write a story that had a character in it with the name of a close family member or a friend I see all the time. Yeah, or something like that. Or it would have once to again, be that name, unless it's, it's deliberate. Well, yes. I'm not the type of writer who normally deliberately puts real people in my stories. It's mm -hmm. just never been the way my brain works. But if I did that, then yeah, like I'd totally give them their real name. If Why it was, not? Hey, you're going to be in my book. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually, more when I write, I find myself doing the opposite. Like, And that is one reason I have avoided names in the past. I hadn't really ever thought about it before, but I have avoided names of anyone close to me because what I'm worried about is pollution. Like, mm -hmm. I want this character to be my character. I don't want to be, right. like, trying to write some other person's character into my story. Like, it, yeah. you know, unless it's a biography or something like that. Um, yeah. I I've done things where I've pulled character traits, like, uh, in a general fashion. Like, I, I want this mother, to this character to feel motherly. Right. So I might think of mother figures or grandmother type figures that I know and be like, right. what are some of their oh. mannerisms that spark that feeling for me it's more and i might use that but not in a yeah. super specific this character is my mom kind of way because right. that feels awkward too personal too personal and too yeah. awkward and yeah like that's already that's already a character that's already a person yeah right that's, and a, that's point. not what i want to do now one thing it's like i've done some for names Fan and fiction. for language especially in rps is i will i don't know how well this works to be honest with you i'll come up with a subset of letters that to me kind of typify that feeling now this was a traditional D and D campaign that I one that I did it. So like for elves, it was I believe it was A E and I, and then like mm -hmm. L R N. Like I would just like liquidy kind of consonants yeah. and e -L, yeah. trails. And then yeah. when I made names, I would just kind of look at those lists of characters. Whereas dwarves, it would be like K and M and V and mm -hmm. O and Harder. U and stuff like that. And I found that that when you're having Probably the whole G. lot of names at once, mm -hmm. like for say your city guard or something, right? Um, having a short list like that helps because yeah. it happens all the time in video games, and this drives me insane. We think mentioned it before where you get into like a town and everybody has a different accent and everybody has a different style of name like you've got dave yeah. over here and, and mchamish over there and like adonis over there it's just and you're a like, complete like what? like <laughs> culture salad like shh, just throw yeah. it all in there shake it up actually i came up with a theory about that though i think because like the one I noticed it a lot in was Darkstone, and it was literally the only village in the entire world. So I'm thinking maybe it was like everything else got destroyed and all the refugees ended mm. up in this yeah. town, and that's why they all have different accents and names. That would make sense. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> Since there are no other villages, like, they didn't produce anything. I think they had, like, three chickens that ran around, but somehow they supported an entire village with no trade. <laughs> wow. No trade and no adventurers, but mm -hmm. the main character and whoever else was right. in there. So yeah, the magic of video games. I played very little of that game, but it was a fun Diablo clone. Oh, it was! It was I love. It was a really good bad game. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> the other one that tops my list of that is um, Earth Defense Force. It's a uh, it's an Xbox game. I'll I have, have heard of it. Point. I've heard it, and I've heard it's I've heard of it, and I've heard it's actually very fun. And it is a lot be, of like, fun to the geez. point that I got my own copy just a few years ago. This game, the one that's really awesome, is like ten years old. Yeah. Um. So I was trying to find a copy of it for myself once I finally got an Xbox 360, and I had to call like five Game Stops, and I oh finally called and like they're like, "Oh my God, we have one left in stock. I'm going to put it behind the counter for you with your name on it, so that no one else can get it." I'm okay. like, "Really?" They're like, "This game is awesome." I'm like, "I know." <laughs> so. I mean, it was a discount bin. I think I got it for two it. bucks, but it was so popular that they're like, we're going to put this away wow. so that yeah. no one else can come get your 10-year-old terrible, terrible game. Well, that's nice. That's I, the nostalgia. There was a sequel, too, if I remember right, called uh, Earth Defense Force 2055. Is that Which right? I or was accidentally that... got first, and it was uh, terrible. The oh. second one was awful. Well, I mean, the first the one was... 
Awful. No, no, no. <laughs> the, the first, okay, the first one was ter- a terrible game, but so much fun. Okay. The second one was a much better designed game and boring as shit. Uh, like, it had nothing good. Uh, and then the third one, they came out just a few years ago, and it is actually as awesome as the first one. Like, they have new character nice. types and stuff. They're like, after the second one, I think the box actually says, we decided to... Um, make player experience a higher priority than graphics. Oh. Like, I think is what they said. Like, basically, it, sure. it's a shit game again. Yeah. You've got the ragdoll physics that will literally have you rolling down a hill for, like, 20 minutes where you're like, can <laughs> I just die yet, please? No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but just a lot of fun. You can't die yet. You're the last defense force this earth has. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Get in there, soldier. <laughs> You like the taste of my bullets? <laughs> Eat lead. They're lemon pepper. Eat lemon pepper. Delicious. <laughs> I'll, I'll assault you. Okay, uh, so <laughs> in order to Sorry. segue a little bit into Nick's topic, oh. uh, my final, I guess, group of questions is going to be, let's talk some about naming conventions in mm. cultures. Like, not just I prefer names that are short, but like, if you're building a world, mm-hmm. what kind of naming conventions could you build into a world to make it unique? Then also readable and fun and not really annoying. <laughs> right. That's, uh, that's tough. I, ha- I de- I, I'm a dungeon master for a game where I created the whole world and the storyline and like... D&D. Home, yeah, D&D. Homebrew from the ground up. And what I did for a lot of my regions was base them on things in the real world so people would get an instant feel Ah. for kind of what was going on. So I have an area that's in this marshy riverland type of place. And so then the names of the people there are very, like, Creole, Louisiana-style names. And then I have, like, a northern area that's, like, these dwarf shepherd people, and their names were more Norwegian, English, Viking-y type of name. And that way, people got an instant feel for what kind of place this was. I didn't even notice you you did that. Yeah. It was so, That's it funny. Was, and, it was and, pretty subtle. And there was but, yeah. um, a whole island of, like, druids that were mostly elves, and they had a little bit of an elfy type name, but they also had a lot of names that were influenced by uh, Japanese names. Oh, and things like that, so you instantly got this feeling that this monastery had kind of a Japanese gardeny feel. Yeah. And so the name. I've done that too. There had one story that I found a list of medieval French words because medieval French is as different from modern French as Middle mm-hmm. English or Old English is to English. Different. Um, and then I used those. It was like a whole page of just random medieval French phrases, and I just mm-hmm. kind of used those syllables to put together words that sounded like that. Yeah. Without actually being that. Yeah. Yes. And I think that kind of naming convention I like personally because yeah, then you do get this flavor that gives your mind these connotations that you so you don't have to spell it out as much because people hear right. it and they, they well, think of certain things it, it makes sense because uh well it depends i would say following that it it what you're saying really depends on the audience that's reading it and so what you're doing just by the action of making these names similar to what we all already know and involving our uh, schema, I think is the word, mm-hmm. um, you are increasing the relevance to the reader for, for all of this and mm-hmm. contextualizing it in a way that's so subtle but actually leads quite well into uh, suspending disbelief, right? Because it's nothing you have to... There's no Work weight involved. Yeah, yeah you, you're not... Lift, it's not heavy lifting to think like, oh, well, it's relatively nordic like because they you know it's like they all have nordic sounding names so they're in the snow like right. it's, it's a very easy process yeah it's and you know what sense. video game actually used that really well is the elder school elder scrolls series like mm-hmm. their skyrim is clearly based on scandinavia and you even right. have well, people named like thorgrim and sven well <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then you have the the very uh roman derived you know uh what mm-hmm. are they the empire and yeah, so the they, imperials you know they all have Names like, like uh, that end in Ilias and, and various exactly. other like yeah. things 
you know, with and another series, a, and, a mm-hmm. book series that did really good with that too is the Belgariad, which is old. You guys may not have heard of it. It was by a guy named David Eddings. It was long. It was like a twelve book mm-hmm. series. Then he did a bunch yeah. more. Um, but he had like the different areas based on different real world historical cultures, kind of loosely, mm-hmm. right? But it was really clear, and some of them were based on not real world cultures, but honestly, Western stereotypes of real world cultures. Like, they had one part that was the swamp, and it was kind of Egyptian inspired, but it was swampier, and it was all like poison and like oh, wow. backstabbing and politics, and and that was never a real place. But we right. all know that place, like yeah. intrinsically. Right. If we grew up on Western stories, we know that place. Mm-hmm. Isn't isn't that the name of uh, politics these days? Like Washington D.C. <laughs> the swamp. Drain like, the swamp. How appropriate. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very potent yeah. archetype and that is, for it to. Those are potent connotations. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was effective. True to life. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think the flip side can be true if you're, say, writing a, a sci-fi and you want the names to feel very alien. Then you would want names that don't remind you of anything or that have right. a different structure entirely. And that can and give think, you that this isn't anything we know about kind of feel. Right. And I think that's where you run into a lot of the problems with names like Ushvashid or, like, too many apostrophes or things like that. Is there... Yeah. Now, the best thing I ever saw... Now, I'm on the fence about this. Some books will give you, like, a pronunciation guide for the names. And I've always felt like, like, if you have to explain it, I don't want to have to read an entire separate thing and then memorize it. But the best one I saw, and this I did like, is it was at the end of the book, and the author had an Mm. intro to it. He said, so, everyone asks me how these names are pronounced. And the answer is, however you say it in your head is how you pronounce it. Yeah. If you... If you want to know how I say it in my head, these are the pronunciations I use. But there are no right or wrong pronunciations. And I was like, that's a great intro. That would have been my answer for that question, too, honestly. Like, you know, there are so many times where I've read a name and it's just like, well, don't, you know, it doesn't matter. If you weigh it too much as a a reader, Mm -hmm. you know... It's, it's like you're missing the point. Just move well, on. Well, like, I read one recent great book. I greatly recommend it, by the way. It's, um, the name is J-H-E-R-E-G, which I pronounce as Jerig. Now, he has a pronunciation yeah. guide, which I didn't look at until, like, book three. And apparently you pronounce that word something like Gerog. Oh. Which, okay, fine, except that, like, I'm three books into the series by now, and that was never actually said in the text itself, and it is the title of the first book, and also something that gets mentioned a lot the entire time. So I'm like, no, it's pronounced Jarek, because that's the way it is in my head. Yeah. By contrast, the main character's last name is T-A-L-T-O-S, which looks like Taltos, Mm -hmm. but it's pronounced Taltish. And you know that because he actually says that in the story. He goes, yeah, like, right. I know I didn't know him because he pronounced my name, like, Taltos, and that's <laughs> not it. It's like this. And I'm like, okay, cool. Like, I will buy that his name is pronounced that way. I have a name that's pronounced weird, too. That's... But if you're never going to mention it. That's a hell of yeah. a setup. So he had to write a whole section where this main character's name was on a piece of, like, paper. And so someone else had to read it. Like, Jared <laughs> yeah, Taltos. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this whole like Which, intricate yeah. setup just I mean, for learning just... the name. It's like too much. Like focus on your plot. Like though, I mean, except that can be a character. It did develop that character some because yeah. he was a they call them Easterners, humans mm. by modern parlance, living in a society of what are essentially elves, right. long lived, pointy ears, etc. And so the fact that he had this Eastern name that no one could pronounce. And uh, the, that he yeah. cared deeply about it. Like, for example, if you know anyone whose name starts with a K or a C, such as Christy or Christopher or Karen, or whether it's a C or a K is vitally important. Do not ever screw that up because every one of those people mm-hmm. care deeply that it is a K you know, not a C or vice versa. That's very true. I get really annoyed when people spell my name with a K. And not annoyed to like usually say anything, but like if I go get a coffee and they write my name and they spell it with a K and or add a silent I. Yeah. I'm right. like, why? Clara. Well, it they just it's yeah because it, Claire has a silent I, but not 
Clara. Yeah, and they'll write it like Claire, but with an A instead of an E. And I'm like, what? I remember a time that we were down at, you were up visiting, and we were down in Olympia, and there where somebody had drawn chalk on the road. And one of the things on there was the name Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E. And I remember you standing there getting like super judgy, which I totally agree. You're like, I don't understand why they have to add three more letters to have less syllables. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes thank you. It's long. The word Claire is longer than the word Clara, but has one fewer syllable. Why? Why don't you just... Take away the, the A at the end, or yeah, add everything the e, is derived. But, There's but someone to point to the finger at. The <laughs> like in my experience, if it's got that many extra vowels, none of which you pr pr actually pronounce, it is probably a French origin. It, yeah, probably, and that's annoying well, in English. I mean, <laughs> kind of like daughter, like daughter is a Norse word that was D O T T I R. Yes. And like the French just stole it for a couple centuries and then gave it back with like 13 extra letters. Yeah, silent none of which you pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> is I've I've heard it before also that um, there is some this is probably total bullshit and I'm misremembering or something but I've heard this oh yeah all my stuff's been bullshit Don't I know I know that's that's how I feel today too um, but no I've heard that it's somewhat important in uh, personality features that develop like when people have an awareness of their own name yet like people might have. Uh, uh, proclivity to have certain personality features if it's a, a K or a C using your earlier example. Um, well, and it is. It's a weird feedback loop because this is something that kind of came up in psychology. You've heard about the twin studies, right? Where twins, identical twins raised was, apart, yeah. Yeah. share a lot of features. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, so the, the general conclusion that you get from the study is that a lot of these are genetic, but what are some other possible things that this pattern could signify? Right. And I said, we tend to react to people based on how they look. So if they look identical, maybe people yeah. just react to them same their whole life. Wow. And the same can be true for names. Yeah. yeah. And that was one thing I was thinking about with connotation. Like, I don't think I could ever write a character whose first name was David because I've known some great Davids in my life, but I've also known a few notable exceptions that I yeah. despise. Mm. And that was always going to color that character. Right. Yes. I can think of multiple people who I've, over the years have been like, oh, I hate the name whatever, because everyone I meet who's named whatever is a jerk. And it's like, are they? Or are you just expect them to Or is that confirmation bias? Yeah, is it that a little bit too? Because I... But I think we do. We do become mm -hmm. like our names, and our we also, our names become like us, but, and I, my friend Christo pointed out that just having a weird name can change your entire life. Right. Because yeah. he said, Starting from kindergarten, he had a few other things too. He was left-handed, and I think he has some reading issues. But just being named Christo, like like in the Greek, K-R-I-S-T-O, he said he had to spell it for everyone he met. He had to explain it yeah. to everyone he met. It's kind of and a cool it, name. I like it, but yeah, it is an awesome name. But I, clearly, he can never be bothered by demons like from Supernatural, the show, because all you have to do is say Christo, <laughs> yeah, and they, right? go, they, yeah. they re which they promptly forgot. It showed up in like one episode, and they've never used it again. They're like That's that made true. it too easy to find demons. Yeah, so. yeah. Power scaling on uh, that is ridiculous. Yeah, it's to change it. But yeah, forth. growing up with an unusual name, especially one that nobody knows how to spell or pronounce can yeah. really change your character your personality yeah yeah i mean it, it's ooh. it's true i remember seeing a documentary one time about people with odd names or <laughs> names that were the same as a famous there's, person there's one on netflix i think that might be the one i'm talking yeah. about. i don't remember what it was called what is it called hold on and shout out to this cool documentary on netflix and the people talking about that all had profound ways that their strange name or being named after a famous person had affected them and some people were ashamed of it some people were really proud of it and they were like no we're awesome it can't really the other thing to remember is whether or not names fit like we don't Perfect. think about this because most people they had never feel a disconnect from their name in fact they feel very attached to their name yeah people named they, virginia they are like 10 times more likely to move to virginia than people not named Virginia. that's weird that's interesting Isn't that weird? Born we out? are attracted to things that are familiar to us yeah so if your sense. name is edwardson you're more likely to live on edward court than victoria court without even being aware of it that makes uh, a lot of sense now that it you does because you see the name and you get that jolt of pleasure. You're like, yeah. it's totally on a subconscious level. Dopamine, who? Yeah. But some of us did not get the first, the right name the first time around. I actually sent around a petition in the first grade 
to try and change my name and got every one of my classmates to sign it. Now, I was in the first grade, so I made a terrible choice, and I'm really glad I took that petition home, and my parents were like, yeah, that means absolutely nothing to us. Yes. Um, but my name never fit the name that I was given when I right. was born. What was the um, name that you wanted in first grade? Oh, God, it was terrible. I'm not even going to say it out loud. <laughs> That's okay. It, well, did, it, did it involve boogers and oh, or bad yeah. stuff? No, it did not involve boogers, <laughs> thankfully. No, but it did kind of make me sound like a porn star. <laughs> <laughs> As a kid, you don't know. You're just like, it sounds powerful. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, uh, that name, or that movie about names, actually, uh, is appropriately titled The Strange Name Movie, and it's on Netflix. Oh. Okay, that, yeah. that yeah. is a strange name that oh, is a little on the nose. No, no it's on Prime oh, Video. Oh, Prime. No. Oh, with, well, it might be both. I don't know. Either way. That would be odd. It's on Amazon Prime, apparently. Okay. It sure. says it is available on YouTube, Amazon Prime, and Google Play. Nice. Nice. There, you go. there we go. Um... But yeah, I, I, I personally think that Naming a character is important in that if you get it really, really right or really, really wrong, <laughs> it can really, really mess up your story. You know, it's kind of like real life names in that same way. Like, mm -hmm. like we were saying, it's a feedback thing. Like, if the name's okay, it and the character will fit each other better over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if they're really wrong, that's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think we've all probably met somebody where we're like, oh, that name that name totally is perfect for you. Or, what? That's your name. <laughs> yeah, but you're not a that at all. Yeah. yeah. Or they don't, they don't look like a Stephanie or whatever. Like, right? And it's funny you said that, and I had an image pop into my head of what I assume a Stephanie looks like. Uh -huh. And we all do that about all names. And mm -hmm. as someone who grew up reading and writing, mostly traditional fantasy that is set in other worlds. Racist. That is actually, I despise naming characters in a real world setting because uh, every name has so many connotations and sense. so much baggage with it. And yeah. also they're boring. I'm like, how do I know if he's a Charles or a Hank? Like really, why do I care <laughs> also? Maybe John, but my right. characters have opinions. Yeah. I had one who, I was looking at names and I was picking a bunch and I didn't like any of them and they were none of them right and then I looked down and I had three names in a row and it was John Aaron Graham and the character in my head went, that's me. And I'm like, that's a boring name. He goes, I don't care, that's me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. So, right. he had, so he even has a middle name. He had such strong opinions about his name wow. and that's not super common for me as no. a writer. No. I, I've had things happen where I've named Helpful. a character something and then as I'm writing it, I'm like, that doesn't, nope, that's not it. That is not what their name is at all. And sometimes I have to think about it or not think about it before it comes to me. And they're like, okay, yeah, that, that makes more sense. Yeah. And honestly, Nick, I am always have been cautious about having working names because the connotation and the character can kind of <laughs> get so interlocked. Like, yeah. I don't want to get through an entire draft and be like, I can't see this guy as anybody but Hiro Makiro-san. Like, maybe, maybe his name is Hiro and he's Japanese, since that is a Japanese That could name. be appropriate, yeah. Sure. Hiro Protagonist um, was, a, was a character in a book I read once uh, called Snow. And Star. also... Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, heroes. Heroes. Oh, the hero. First hero and heroes. Hero. Yeah. 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 That was very on the nose. That was like three yeah. or four layers of on the nose. Right. And it stopped being on the nose again. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god though but i will use working titles for my manuscripts and those oh, don't yes. get stuck the same way as character no names yeah. do. that not, makes not sense. often they do not yeah it yeah. would be funny if in your working title you you actually modeled how the story was gonna go like rags to riches <laughs> for elves <laughs> like, for elves for, 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 for the soul <laughs> for the soul <laughs> No, let's see. Current working titles that I have, some of them I have the real title, like Who's Afraid of Virginia City. Then there's Shaft of Destiny with That's exclamation true. points. That has That's nothing my to do with the story like either. Really there was an fun. arrow, and also it was a gay romance, so, you know. Then it was a porn. <laughs> it wasn't a porn. <laughs> not, not necessarily. Um, then I have one though. that a friend of mine titled called Glowy Blue Lesbians. You'll have to read the book to find out why. It's not written yet, so good luck with that. Oh, well done. <laughs> that's, that's a tease. I heard Avatar. <laughs> what? <Yeah. laughs> the oh, Avatar fanfic. Speaking like of, <laughs> wasn't it you guys, wasn't it, wasn't it Marcus who said that the Emoji movie was Pocahontas? <laughs> I don't remember, but very possibly. It I was think it was like that. I don't remember. But speaking of story types and how the Cinderella is the New Testament, apparently... <laughs> 
Yeah. The Emoji Movie is Pocahontas. <laughs> I oh, believe wait, it. No, it was. It wasn't Pocahontas. I, it was Hung, not Hunger Games. Um, shoot. They had like each book had its own title, and they were all the same. And it was with the f- four houses. I hate it when I do this. Harry oh. Potter. What? Harry Potter? <laughs> <laughs> no, not Harry Potter. Later than that, they were in Chicago, like ruined Chicago, and she grew up. Um, not diligence. Divergence. Yeah. Oh. Divergence, that's it. Somebody said the Emoji movie was Divergence. That wow. series was oh. the same plot. Like, they actually, like, and they went through it plot point by point, and it was. Like, they, they left the city just like they did in Divergence and found out it was all a lie, and, like, it was crazy. Wow. <laughs> I have seen a few things where I'm like, this is just the Matrix, but... <laughs> well, okay, and I'm realizing that as I've passed 40, like, most things that I see on TV I've seen before and not just once or twice but like two or three dozen times by now because I love story and I finally I'm like okay so I'm at this point where I can either like ah shit there's nothing new I'm bored with all of it and give up or I can be like let's enjoy this again in a new form and find new things in it well and it's always a you know sort of people breaking it down into like to where like changing the lens uh, on the story to where certain facts are more granular than others like different levels so there's always something to appreciate mm-hmm. that you know and well most of the time unless it's just a straight up rip off like but you yeah. do see a lot of those too you do. like frankly is it and like, honestly some of them that I've really liked I'll be honest like there were a couple yeah. really obvious rip offs of the lord of the rings that I read when I was a kid that I liked better because yeah. They didn't say he cried with an exclamation point all the time and also devolve into three pages of gorgeous description that did nothing for the story. Like, yeah. they're like, let's take this plot and actually write it as a story there instead was, of a myth. There yeah. was one uh, that I recall called the Sword of Sh- Shannara. It, they turned oh. it into a series. Uh, the Shannara on, Chronicles or something? On MTV. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was the, the like, you know... I grew up on titles. those. Um, I thought they were pretty good. Uh, I they were. Yeah, um, a great twist, lovable characters. Like, I remember mm. to this day, and I haven't read them it's, since. It's gone on and on and on. Apparently there's, like, hundreds of them now in the Shannara wow. series, and wow. I kind of stopped after a while. But my favorite was the Elf Stones. I don't know why, but I yeah. always really liked that. I one. read the first three, and that was enough the, for me. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I poked it a few later, but that core trilogy kind of was the story. Everything else was just kind of... Right. Extra. Mm. Right. Fanfic. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. You know I've what? written bad fanfic of my own stuff because I didn't want to let, like what Clara was saying earlier about I love these characters so much that I just kind of, I finished one of my novels and spent like the next month writing terrible fan fiction with no plot because I just could not let those characters go. I'm like, I miss them. I need yeah. them in my life. <laughs> That's to a them. good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sign of success, like at least in, in terms of generating likable characters for yourself. And, yeah. and, <laughs> and complex characters. If a character doesn't feel complex and yeah. deep and you're interesting, you're you're not going to be able, them. well, you're not going to want to keep knowing and keep interacting with them in yeah. any way. Right. Yeah. Just like in real life, if you meet somebody and they're super boring and all they ever talk about is the weather, you're not yeah. going to like, I should get to know them better. What if they right. were a wizard and then also <laughs> did they? <laughs> all they did was sit around and talk about the weather. Okay, that would actually be a fun char- what if side they, character. What if they made book. the weather and then they talked about the weather? Yeah. <laughs> they, maybe you, you never want to talk about the weather with them because if they ever mention anything <laughs> weather related, it will manifest whether right. they want it to or not. And then, but they're also a weatherman. Plot twist. <gasps> Plot twist. <laughs> and they're also. They're also not a weatherman at all, but in charge of ancient or newfangled machinery and are a cleric in the local town for a religion. That, a well, are there clerics setting. in the local town that aren't for a religion? I mean, are they for, just like for a religion. generic clerics? Like, we're humanist in, clerics. In a world where there's no we're technology. Agnostic. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I just made the most derived story like, ever. I am a cleric of the deity of self-actualization. I, I think I just wrote yes. some sort of Shannara or Shannara s- Chronicles fanfic right there, actually, because oh. that was it, that was its setting. Like it was after some kind of crazy war. Oh yeah, and you everybody didn't say that got to, like, the mutated. second book, but it was like yeah. two million years after the apocalypse in our world. Yeah, and there was Yo, still all yes. the relics of like the past. You know, there's like a car. The, yeah, like, it was full on just high fantasy Middle Earth kind of thing. And like halfway through the second book, they found ruins with like old canned food and shit. Like, yeah, like weird. a flashlight. <laughs> it's like these are from the ancients I'm like wait what spoiler alert <laughs> I mean that's a, well I think at this point we don't need it but that's book. I mean I that's a really 
interesting thing. That's a taking a classic story and like flipping it. It's not the fantasy that came and then the regular world. It's the opposite. Like I think that kind of storytelling is really fascinating if if it's yeah. done right. Exactly, and this it didn't. Okay, so one of my pet peeves personally, as a fantasy lover, is stories that are set up as traditional fantasies, and like right at the end, there's this trick reveal where it was science fiction all along. My yeah. favorite one of these is once again Dragon Riders of Pern by Anne McCaffrey. Because if you read the core trilogy, it's fa- high fantasy, and then you get to the very end, and suddenly, like those stars are satellites, and the dragons mm-hmm. were genetically engineered from native lizards, and uh. I'm like. Why did you do this? Like, seriously, if you just yeah. ended the book a chapter earlier, it would have been fine. Um, Shannara didn't bother me the same way because it was not the twist ending at the yeah. end. Right. It, but it also wasn't handled great because it was kind of out of place. You were like, mm. wait, what? <laughs> I thought it was interesting because it, it was like, it, it explained certain things in the backstory, like uh, the ogres specifically and like all the weird mm-hmm. races that you had come out of it. Like, um, and, and embodying the typical fantasy archetypes of races, you know? So yeah. you had ogres, elves, gnomes, I think, gnomes. And, and dwarves, and they were all just it was, really It may have been the first story that classified gnomes as engineers, and I've seen that in a lot of things since. You know I what? But I, it that. may have been the first, because yeah. they were crazy-ass engineers in that story, I too. think they were, yeah. Not to interrupt too much, but I think this is the perfect time to segue into our third topic. <laughs> it would be... Yeah, I agree. Okay, that wraps up part one of issue two. Let's talk about writing here at The Odd Times. Thank you for watching and or listening. And remember to like and subscribe. Join us next time for part two.